All right, we are at tape three, side two, and I want to welcome everyone back as we, as we continue our discussions about deeper prayer, deeper spirituality from the t context of the Trinity, particularly the, from the point of view of the Father, the point of view of the Father, which is depicted in art. Salvador Dali made a painting based on an image scratched in pencil on paper by St. John of the Cross of the crucifixion of Christ, unique in the history of the church because it's the first time depicted in Catholic art of the point of view of looking at the crucified Christ as a father looks at his son, as the father of the Trinity looking down from heaven upon the son who is crucified. We're trying to move to that Trinitarian outlook on matter, on things, and what the Father's trying to achieve through his son Christ, through the Holy Spirit, a procession from the will of the Trinity. And I hope that helps you as we go into deeper prayer and deeper spirituality. And we're trying at the same time to provide, if this were a river, banks on which will flow your enthusiasm, which will flow your suffering, which will flow your endurance to keep you on track because there are so many temptations, there's so much that is scarred by ignorance, so much that's scarred by imperfection that can drain this river and make it pour out upon uh, and diffuse in the wrong area, and you want to flow freely into union with God. All right, so I think it's apt, it's appropriate on this last tape to talk about our Father as having problems. I don't think we often think of that that our Holy Father, not Christ, not the Holy Spirit, but our Father, could be having problems. We think of him as someone who we go to to solve our problems. But he does have problems. And I want to watch how I want you to watch how this develops. Because you're the solution. Problems occurred in existence when he made a free will. But let's talk in terms of a couple of points we'll underlie and you'll find out how much you can do to help your father as he works out what he his vision in creation and he needs your cooperation he needs your help and i want to add here just a nice little encouragement from one of the saints and i believe her name was uh, saint angelina folino f-o-l-i-n-o -I, I may have that a little bit wrong on the spelling but she expresses what many good people believe was a real interaction with Christ and Christ told her this Christ said make yourself a capacity and I will make myself a torrent make yourself a capacity and I will make myself a torrent I want you to think as if those words were spoken by your father and not Christ for John of the cross tells us that the father spoke one word and that word was Christ that Christ came and told us he come to do one thing, and that was to achieve the will of his Father, to be about his Father's business. So let's talk about this Father. We know in theology that the entire Trinity creates, but we attribute for our purposes, our learning, creation with the Father. Redemption with Christ, sanctification with the Holy Spirit. So for our purpose, God the Father creates. There is a distinction in creation between angels and between man. That's just one portion of that distinction, but we know distinctions exist. There's grades and there's orders. The third point, God is attempting to maintenance, to maintain and conserve his creation. In a sense, there is a governance by our Father. He's governing what he created. He has not abandoned it. We are not orphans. What is the goal of our Father in his governance of this creation? He has a very specific goal. He has what the effect of his governance is to assimilate you and I, to assimilate us into himself, into God. So he has these children who are running all over. Some of them are running towards him and are passing him. And his arms are out, and he's attempting desperately. So desperate is this father that he sends his only begotten son christ to gather him up like a hen would gather her little chickens it's the father who's trying to govern and maintain and conserve his creation why he wants to assimilate us into himself 
by what? Since God is good, the assimilation is going to be through being good. We assimilate into our Father by being good. Since God is the cause of good, we assimilate into our Father by moving others to be good. So our Father has two arms that he's out there reaching and pulling us into himself for the purpose of this discussion. The one arm is he's wanting us to assimilate into him by being good. That's a human operation. But he wants us to also assimilate into him by being the cause of others, by moving others to be good. Those are two attributes our Father has. By definition, our Father is good. By definition, God is good. By definition, our Father is the cause of goodness in others. By definition, God is the cause of good in others. Now, let's move this a little further into a tangible topic. Mary. When I talk about Mary, think of yourself. Mary is birthing God. Showing that humans can birth God. You can birth God. Mary is birthing God. Her being fills up with God. Let's look at Mary's operation. She's looking towards God. She's found in prayer when the angel comes to her. She's looking towards God. Her ear, she's listening. And she's acting. She's saying yes. There's three things we can talk about Mary. The looking of Mary towards the Father. The listening of Mary. And the yes, her fiat. And her being fills up with God. The Father, he divinizes her literally. He divinizes her, doesn't, by, by, by birthing Christ in her, the divinity dwells in her womb. Body, blood, soul, and divinity is in her womb. Does it change her? Only by participation is her essence transformed. Her operations are the operations of God. Her very being, her substance takes on by participation. God, in her being. This is an example, an exemplar for you and I to do the same, for our operations to be divinized, for us to take God in, into us. The very body and blood, the flesh and the blood you receive in communion is the same flesh and blood that Jesus received from Mary. God just screams that at us. And we then imitate Mary. What does Mary do? Mary simply is being good by saying yes to her father. And she had freedom. She was asked. She wasn't forced. She's being good. And she's the cause of goodness in others. We get right back to the Trinity. God is good and he's the cause of goodness in others. Do you see that? God is good and he's the cause of goodness in others. What does Mary do? Mary is good. Because of her participation in God, Mary is good, and then Mary becomes the cause of goodness in others. She's birthing Christ, who's going to redeem the entire race, who's going to be a means to which the, the spiration of the Holy Spirit will sanctify. We can become spiritual neighbors of our neighborhoods, spiritual leaders of our neighborhoods, in the same way, by birthing Christ, and being the cause of good in others. The, the only limit there is, is our, there's no other limit other than God's will. He will provide boundaries, he'll provide nourishment, he'll provide that. But understand what he's trying to do. Understand what the potential you and I have. Don't be frightened to look in truth, to be immersed in truth at this. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. It can be very frightening to understand the greatness that God calls us to because we can say, I, I can't do that. We're not talking about your action right now. We're simply talking about the ideal that we have before us. None of this can be accomplished on our own. Be not afraid. The Holy Father wrote an entire book to encourage because he knows as you begin to walk up to this precipice of great truth, this abyss of truth, beautiful truth, that it can be frightening.
you can begin to get a little wobbly and very frightening and people who know will back off oftentimes be not afraid there's answers on how you accomplish this right now i'm simply lining up for you laying out for you the beauty the depth of deep prayer and deep spirituality the ideal now keep in mind to encourage you mary loves joseph she loves jesus she's a good neighbor she's performing her functions in the Jewish community. So this birthing of Christ, this union with God, is not inconsistent with your duties in life. Mary was not a nun. Joseph was not a priest. And they were very close to God, and they were accomplishing, they were helping their, your Father in Heaven. They were doing this. Now, let's take a look at what our intention here is as we go deeper into this. Our intention is consistent with what St. John of the Cross is attempting to do in the Ascent of Mount Carmel, Book 3, page 272, Chapter 33. And here again, we have this detachment theme. Our intention, this is John of the Cross, our intention in this work is to guide the soul through spiritual goods to divine union with God. The first portion was about things that are bad. People are avoiding bad things. There comes a time when there's going to be good things that can still hinder your union with God. So we are, there is a need to guide the soul through spiritual goods. These are not spiritual bads. Spiritual goods to divine union with God. And so, and there is a lack of knowledge in this area, so he points out it is common in certain currents with some to let spiritual things serve only for the senses and leave the spirit empty. And he continues, be, for the senses drink up the waters before they reach the spirit and thus leave the spirit dry and empty. I'm only going to be able to introduce this concept with the limited time I hear, so it's the danger. You can. There's other tapes that I have to be to, to develop this. But again, good things can hinder your relationship with God. And I illustrate it by quoting John of the Cross. But telling you that there is a balance here that you can't react to the good things by becoming a hermit by shutting yourself off from neighbors. So I'm, I'm walking a tightrope here. Goods of the world, spiritual goods, can be hindrance to union with God, yet you have an obligation that your union with your Father is consistent with love of neighbor. That's a tightrope. That's a tough thing to walk, but it can be done. Now, consider this. John the Cross, and I quote from paragraph 4 of this chapter 33, we can also divide these goods according to the faculties of the soul. Those dealing with the knowledge are pertinent to the intellect. Those referring to affections belong to the will. And others, insofar as they are imaginary, pertain to the memory. So he's going to go through all that he teaches, all that you learn on John of the Cross, is perfecting these three faculties, purging them from what is not God, detaching them, getting their appetites off of what not is what is not God to turn them on to God. Let me kind of say this in a different way. There's a lot of talk about that which is uh, painful in the spiritual life. We talk about the passive night. But those things that are delightful, uh, they are not so well understood. Delightful things can hinder your union with God. So, again, there's going to be delight in knowledge for the intellect, there's going to be affection in the will, and there's going to be imagination, imaginary items in the memory. These all, if not properly controlled, maintained, and conserved, can limit your union with God. So we want to think about that, and that's why we're going, we're shifting gears slowly into a more deeper area, and I'm moving from the a passive night of the senses into the passive night of the spirit so that the soul will understand there is this progression there's levels and orders and that's simply the goal to introduce some of these with you and encourage you on this tape all right i have to inoculate you now with a little concept from john the cross that's going to be painful for many people it's not discussed because it certainly isn't going to increase my popularity or anybody's popularity who talks about this but he's very clear about it be very gentle when you convey this concept to others we are now moving into the realm we're just barely scratching the surface of a little deeper prayer deeper spirituality chapter 36 book 3 the ascent of mount carmel and i've seen this in communities and i've seen this in spiritual people 
Much could be said about the ignorance of many in their use of statues. Their foolishness reaches such a point that they trust more in one statue than in another and think that God will answer them more readily through it even when both statues represent the same person, such as those of our Lord or our Blessed Lady. At the bottom of this idea is their greater attachment to the one work than to the other, which entails gross ignorance about communion with God and the cult and, uh, and honor due him who looks only upon the faith and purity of the prayerful heart. Well, people will then hear that and say, he's talking about appetites and attachments for good things. A statue, an image of Christ, or an image of Mary. These are difficult things to talk about. But he addresses them, and he addresses them head on. Now, and people can have a favoritism and an appetite towards one or the other, or even different replications. He understands that. He understands that. Lower individuals are going to do this. As you advance, you have to detach yourself from this. Listen to what he says. And he, and he recognizes, and the argument is going to be, well, God acts through them, and he, why would he give me favors to them? Watch the response. If God sometimes bestows more favors through one statue than through another, he does not do so because it's of its greater ability to produce this effect, even though there may be notable differences in the workmanship, but because the devotion of individuals is awakened more by means of the one statue than the other. Should the person... Persons have equal devotion in the presence of both, and even the same devotion without the aid of either statute, God would grant them the same favors. Do you see what he's saying? And read that for yourself. He, he want, God, he, then he goes on, he says, God does not work miracles and grant favors by means of some statues in order that these statues may be held in higher esteem than others, but that through this his wonderful works he may awaken the dormant devotion and affection of the faithful. It's almost as if your poor father in heaven is forced to use these things to get your attention. If you're married, it's like you're, you're forced to use a locket of your hair to draw the attention of your spouse to you, or a picture. You're standing there in the same room, and you cut a locket of your hair, and your spouse will grab the locket, or you give them a picture, and you're standing right next to them, and they just go, uh, they're excited about the locket of hair, and they're excited about the picture of you, and the real you is standing right next to them. You're standing. Wouldn't that hurt your heart? Wouldn't that be almost rude? But your poor father, this is what he's doing. This is how he has to do it. It doesn't mean the locket of hair is, in, less in, is not important. It is. It doesn't mean the picture of you is not important. It is. It doesn't mean the ring on the spouse's finger is not important. It is. But wouldn't you want your lover, your spouse, your children to give you a hug, to embrace you, to be affectionate towards you and not the effects of you? Do you see that? That's what he's trying to illustrate here. And you're, this is the job that your father's trying to do. He needs lots of workers. He's busy doing this. And in every generation, he repeats that. He gives them a new image of himself. He does them a new holy place to go to in order to awaken in their devotion. But ultimately, he wants you to embrace him through pure faith, pure love, pure joy. That's what he wants. He wants you to move from the locket of hair, from the picture, to him. And that's why we're talking about this. And, it, and you don't have to go too soon. He's very gentle. Don't drop the locket. If there are certain perfumes, certain things that work with your a good meal, don't stop doing that stuff. God is not going to stop giving these little unctions because we need them. We're in a fallen state. Don't become frightened about this. The only thing that I hope that you grasp, the main message that the Holy Father is trying to convey in the Novo Millennium Mute message is the concept of progression. You progress, you progress, you progress. You transform, you transform, you transform. Now, now that's the beauty of our vocation. It supports you and I. When we embrace this call to holiness, it supports the mission of the church, which is the growth of the church and the sanctification. Again, being good and being the cause of good in others. The growth of the church and the sanctification of the church. Those are missions that we support, you and I, as embracing this call to holiness. Keep in mind that imperfection is the lack of something. 
It's defined as the lack of something. We lack something and we're being going to be made whole by being given something and that is our ultimate perfection. I don't want to lose you in any big long discussions here. Let's move on a little bit deeper. I now want to talk a little bit more about obstacles, more, more concrete obstacles to your running headstrong, full tilt into the arms of the Trinity. Okay, let's talk a little bit about that right now, some precautions and some things to discuss. All right, I simply want to talk about suffering, prayer, and evil rapidly to introduce you uh, to these concepts. February the 17th, Cardinal Ratzinger, co-workers of the truth. Let me read this short paragraph for you and indicate to you globally some encouragement of where you're at in the mind of the church. I begin. It is thoroughly Christian impulse to combat suffering and injustice in the world. But to imagine that men can construct a world without them by means of social reform and the desire to do so here and now is an error, a deep misunderstanding of human nature. For suffering does not come into the world solely because of the inequality of possessions and power, nor is it just a burden from which men should free themselves. Anyone who wishes to do that must escape into the distorted world of narcotics in order thus to destroy himself and to find himself in conflict with reality. It is only by enduring himself, by freeing himself through suffering from the tyranny of egoism that man finds himself, that he finds his truth, his joy, his happiness. He will be all the happier the more ready he is to take upon himself the abyss of existence with all their misery. The, measures of one, the measure of one's capacity for happiness depends on the measure of the premiums one has paid, on the measure of one's readiness to accept the full passion of being human. He continues. This is important and significant. He continues. The crisis of our age is made very real by the fact that we would like to flee from it, that people mislead us into thinking that one can be human without overcoming oneself, without the suffering of renunciation and the hardship of self-control, that people mislead us by climbing that there, claiming that there is no need for the difficulty of remaining true to what one has undertaken, and the patient endurance of the tension between one, what one ought to be and what one actually is. An individual who has been freed from all effort and led into the fool's paradise of his dreams loses what is most essentially himself, what is most essential, himself. There is, in fact, no other way in which one can be saved than by the cross. All offers that promise a less costly way will founder, will prove to be false. The hope of Christianity, the outlook of faith, ultimately rests quite simply on the fact that faith tells the truth. The outlook of faith is the outlook of the truth that may be obscured and trampled upon, but can never perish. All right, now, I want you to understand that in that context about suffering, in that context of what the Holy Father, Cardinal Ratzinger just said, keep in mind one of his favorite sayings. God chose marriage as the place to give the world Christ. God didn't give Christ in the monastery. God didn't, he could have went and given Christ through the Essenes. He could have, which is a Jewish group that was uh, somewhat hermetical, like hermits, and lived a different type of lifestyle. He didn't. He gave the world Christ through marriage. And if you're married, if you're not a priest, if you're not a nun, it is not inconsistent in your state of life uh, to give Christ to your neighbor. Keep in mind, amidst the suffering, keep in mind that the devil knows this that it's very clear, both Cardinal Ratzinger will speak of this, Thomas Aquinas will speak of this, and it's generally known that driven by jealousy due to the fact that Satan cannot attain happiness, man has a potential to attain happiness, a state of being that Satan is deprived of, that Satan will work. He's an, he appears an angel of light. He will deceive. He's known as the great deceiver. He will deceive you in thinking that where you're at, is inconsistent with any holiness that where you're at that you're in the back seat and you're not in the, in the front seat 
By virtue of baptism, every member in the body of Christ is it lives in a position, in a state of being that can be potentialized, that can be brought into union with the Trinity. And that is to be emphasized so that you understand if you're, you don't necessarily, if you're a priest, you don't have to say, I can't be holy until I become a bishop. If you're a bishop, you don't have to say, I won't, can't be holy unless I'm a pope. If you're a nun, you can't say, gee, I won't be holy unless the church lets me be a priest. That's not true. The, we have equal dignity in the church. That's clarified in canon law. We are of equal dignity. Satan knows that, and he's going to always move you to be tempted to think if you were something other than what you are, then you would have a good excuse to become holy. You're to just do it where you're at. That doesn't mean that you're going to progress and, and move into different parts of the church. That's not to be limited there. But the temptation is to say, I have an excuse because of my circumstances not to be holy. That will not wash in the mind of the church. Consider this, too. I leave you with this, because there will be many, many temptations in this deeper prayer and deeper spirituality. February the 18th, same book, St. John, St. Uh, Car Cardinal Ratzinger. This is how one leads a good life. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself, Luke 10, 27. The first requirement, then, is that God be present in our life. The sum of human life does not strike a balance if we omit God. In that case, only contradictions remain. It is not enough, then, to believe somehow theoretically that there is a God. We must regard him as the most important element in our life. He must be everywhere, and our fundamental relationship to him must be love. That can often be very difficult. It can happen, for instance, that one individual has many illnesses and encumbrances to bear. Poverty makes life difficult for another. Yet a third loses the persons on whose love his whole life depends. Thus, unhappiness can take many forms. And there is a great danger that the individual will become embittered and will say, and this is important, God can certainly not be good. If he were, he would not treat me this way. Such a revolt against God is very understandable. Often it seems almost impossible to accept God's will. But one who yields to this rebellion poisons his whole life. The poison of saying no, of being angry with God and with the world, corrodes the individual from within. But what God asks of us is, as it were, an advance on confidence. He says to us, I know you don't understand me yet, but trust me anyway. Believe that I am good and dare to live by this trust. There are many instances of saints and great individuals who dared to trust and in consequence found themselves and for others true happiness amid the greatest darkness. All right, I want to kind of summarize some thoughts that we've discussed in this tape series. There is a door that God enters your life. He comes through and enters your life, and this door is prayer. And Mary prayed, and there was an intersection between divinity, the divine, and humanity. Mary becomes pregnant with the Trinity in her heart. First there was a desire, and that desire begot God, substantially begot God. What desire was it that Mary had? The desire to do His will. What is the ideal prayer life? There are three points. Transformation, transformation, transformation. Think in terms of transformation, meaning progression. You should be progressing. You should not be the same person you were a year from now or a year ago. You are to be transformed through prayer. Where do we see that at? Mary. Mary begins without being pregnant with God. She's found in prayer. She becomes pregnant with God. She's goodness, and she's the cause of goodness in others. The first transformation is there... We see it in the life of Christ. He transfer, sends family community. He goes forward. He goes into the community, into the temple, and he's found there. Christ is your image. He begins to leave the bonds of family life and goes forward. Think of that as a transformation. Why he was on his earthly life. Transformation number two of Christ. We see this in the liturgy of the Eucharist. There is water poured into the wine. That water represents you and I. The wine 
is transformed and elevated. It be substantially becomes Christ, the body, blood, soul, and divinity. There's another transformation that God is just screaming at you that you can be done. You're intermingled with God, the divinity. It's the wine that being, is being transformed. The water and the wine, you can't separate that out. So substantially, the water is you. Christ is the body, blood, soul, and divinity in that wine. There's a community that celebrates this transcendence of normative life. We see that in nature with the grape that's crushed. It gives juice. Some juice is set aside and fermented. Some fermented uh, uh, juice becomes what we call wine. Some wine is set aside for the tabernacle. This tabernacle wine is set up and is for God alone and it's transformed. It's divinized. And then it's goodness itself and it's the cause of goodness in others. You're called to imitate that transformation. Now, a third transformation. Think of what we discussed, and that's St. John of the Cross. We looked at that page 83, 84. We discussed the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant. This third transformation, you're going to become an Ark of the Covenant where God dwells substantially. He's going to be operating in you. He's going to work in you. You're, you're going to be transformed by participation. But God is going to be present there doing great works. Christ, I no longer live, but Christ liveth in me, St. Paul says. That's that third transformation. Take a look at that. We discussed early on in the tape where the Ark of the Covenant and what was there, the rod of Moses, manna from heaven, and the commandments. Think about that. That's that transformation that I want you to consider. Our conclusion, prayer is a human act. It's an operation. It's not your essence, but it's an operation. And it's a turning towards God that begets a transformation of your essence by participation. The quality of your prayer is going to be the quality of your transformation. Prayer is a virtue. It's a, a religion. It's a virtue of religion. Under justice, religion is a virtue under justice. Justice is one of the four cardinal virtues that supports the three, three theological virtues of, of faith, hope, and love. Prayer is the rubbing of that two sticks together that begets friction, that begets heat, that begets combustion and fire. Prayer is a virtue. It has the power, and virtue is an operation, a human act, an operation. We talked about how prayer is that specific type of operation that can be divinized such that God begins to operate. You begin to have the gifts of the, uh, the gifts of of the Holy Spirit, which is the operation of God, particularly in the, the, the greater levels of prayer, contemplation. The contemplation that involves the intellect, contemplation that involves the will, and a contemplation ultimately that, that is a grabbing of God of both your intellect and your will. All right. I want to continue prayer in a different context so that as you begin to acquire this, you can share it with others in your own way, even better than in any way you can do to expand it and make it better understood. The ideal prayer life is Mary. The effect of prayer is transformation. We have a universal call to this, and I want you to consider prayer in this context. One, God breathes on into the dust of the earth. The dust takes a soul. The question you have to ask is, what is the obligation of this clay that has received a soul? Let me suggest that you continue to be the breath of God in your life and the world. With prayer, you continue to be the breath of God in your life and in the world. This is our context for prayer. It starts with an operation of God. We act out this operation of God, and it ends with an operation of God, the sanctification, the transformative union. It's this breathing. Breathing, an operation that's a turning towards God. Let me ask you this. What is it that does the breathing? The breathing, let's define it. It's not a kiss. It's not a hug. Remember those miracles that can move you? This breathing is not a kiss. It's not a hug. It can be a breathing physical Christ. It can be a breathing spiritual Holy Spirit. All right, to better understand this, I want to go further into this. To better understand this breathing, I want to ask the question, who are we? Who are you? Why are you here? Why am I here? Amidst suffering, pain, and disappointments. All right. 
We are exemplars of God, his life, his image. We have an intellect. Faith will transform our intellect and will allow truth, which is the object of our intellect, to dwell there. That's what's going to do the breathing. Truth in the intellect will breathe. Our will, we have a will. Love is going to transform our will, where goodness will breathe from our will. We have a memory. Hope is going to transform our memory. And that, in our memory, we will breathe happiness. That's what's taking place there. Prayer is an operation of turning towards God. What turns? The intellect. What in the intellect turns? The, you know, faith is going to turn the intellect towards truth. What in the will turns? The act of the virtue of love. Your human virtue of love. Charity is going to turn the will to receive towards good and to receive good. Remember, you're going to be not only absorb this good, you're going to be the cause of good in others. Memory. What turns in us? It's our memory. Our memory turns towards God in hope and receives this happiness. This turning for towards God is from, and this is the two. This is John the Cross in a nutshell. Two stages of this turning towards God. We first turn from the love of creation. This is the purgative stage, dark night of the senses. We're turning from an excess and inordinate love of creation towards God. But that's not enough. We've overcome the love, the inordinate love of creation, and we're turned towards God. But there is a second love that we have to overcome, and that's self-love. We have the purgative stage of the dark night of the spirit. There's this second purging, this night of the spirit, which purges us of self-love. So we're, over, we're turning from two things, love of creation, stage one, self-love, stage two, and then we're able to be facing God and moving towards God. There are stages in prayer. There's vocal prayer. There's meditation, which is uh, stage two involves the mind. Stage three is effective prayer, involves the, the desires and the thirst and the affection for God. It's in the heart, the will. Then stage four is a combination of both, meditation and affection. Stage five is where God does the actions. God grabs your mind, your intellect, and it will infuse you with great thoughts of God. Stage six is where God will grab your heart. You'll be driving down the car, and he may grab a desire or thirst and affection of your heart. And you, I've known people that have to pull over the car because of this. God's grabbing that heart. And uh, you'll almost, uh, what House explained to me, God, go away, not right now like an, an, an impulsive lover. Stage seven, God's grabbing your intellect and your heart together. That's what's going on in this operation of prayer, what's held out for you. It's exciting. Now, think of it, how necessary contemplation is and how powerful it is. It, is, it has its place in the church. It is a beautiful thing. And the Holy Father, in his noble millennial message, is asking everyone to come to a relationship. Just ask God, grant me this favor. Grant me relationship in one way or another with you. Through prayer, let my prayer progress. Teach me what I lack. Teach me what I know. Give me these things. God will give it. He will not be outdone in goodness. Uh, and you just have to make yourself a capacity. I want to conclude somewhat with mystical prayer. The happiness that is yours through mystical prayer, which is this height of prayer, which is this contemplation. And conclude that we have at the marriage feast of Cana this transformation of that which was not. The, the water blushing, some have said, blushing and becoming wine. At the, the, the and, and what is it said that Mary gives you and me? Do whatever he tells you. First of all, there is pain in existence. You will you have family, you will know people, this pain of existence can and will be painful without God. Without participation in God, we have hell. So we have hell, and so it is essential to our happiness to have participation in God. Our whole vocation is directed to nurturing participation in God, which is heaven, which is our happiness. So you enter this vocation, it's directed to supreme happiness, reserved for those who are in union with God. So we encourage, if you come across people who are troubled, come across people who are in pain, drugs, alcohol, broken this, broken that, you have to turn them towards God, which is what is direction, which is the source of an entire other 
teaching, but remember, pain of existence can be overcome by prayer. Keep that in mind, and that's how powerful it is. So, how does the church do this? What can you do to participate in it? In the beginning, we had Adam and Eve. All things were ordered to God. The church characterized this as original justice. There's a fall that results in disorder, chaos, pain, and death. God establishes a church, the body of Christ. This church is active in the history of creation. And to do what? Why does it exist? To reorder all things, all creation, you and me including, to God himself. Christianity is a great fulcrum in history between the origin and the end, Cardinal Ratzinger tells us. How do we do this? The church does it in two ways. It has a teaching office that illuminates everybody. It has, with goodness and truth, you know, it's breathing fresh air of truth into existence. You're told what to believe. That's what the teaching office does. There's the sanctifying office. It's the heart pumping out goodness into the world, being good, and attracting people through this goodness. So you possess knowledge. It's not enough. How do you know this? Because the church of itself does not just have a teaching office. It has a sanctifying office. Now, God created the angels. Into this angel, one of the angels was Satan. He has, he participates in the knowledge of God. Okay? But he lost that participation in God, that love, and so he has a living hell. So it's possible to not have participation in God, to have a living hell and still have knowledge of God. Many people know the Bible inside now, but do not believe. That's why you want to be able to show Christ to others, not just simply tell them about him. So what do we do in the sanctifying office? It brings you to participation in the fullness of God's existence. How? Through the sacraments, sacramentals, devotions, acts of religion, prayer. This is the way, this is the what, the means for this, of sanctifying yourself. See, so, so you understand that your efforts, united with the church's efforts, it bleaches clean the world and all its disorder. What is your primary effort? Prayer. Why? It's conversation with God. Why? Because you have communication. Low level, then substantially. That is the thing about God and the Christ and the Eucharist. He's communicating to you substantially. For what purpose? To unite and transform the Trinity. Why? To help God. To do His will. To be docile. That's what it's all about. To be docile. This is our Pope. Chapter 16 in his Noble Millennial Message. We wish to see Jesus, John 12, 21. This request addressed to the Apostle Philip by some Greeks who had made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem for the Passover echoes spiritually in our ears too during this jubilee year. Like those pilgrims of 2,000 years ago, the men and women of our own day, often perhaps unconsciously, ask believers not only to speak of Christ, but in a certain sense to show him to them. And is it not the church's task to reflect the light of Christ in every historical period to make his face shine also before the generations of the new millennium. And he holds out Christ as a face to contemplate. Striving always to be before to do. Looking at that face to contemplate. That is what the Holy Spirit is speaking to the entire church through this Pope in this air. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory now and forever. Amen. We do that for our Christian brothers and sisters.